Good morning, everyone. A warm welcome here from the representation of the state of Bavaria in uh, Brussels um, to our press conference on uh, the future of innovation policy in Europe. My name is Harald Schulz. I'm the press officer for the IFO Institute. I used to, in a different life, I used to be a correspondent for Reuters, uh, amongst other jobs. Mm, today we launch a study on the innovation policy in the EU in Europe. Uh, the title is How to Avoid the Middle Technology Trap. Um, we've already sent you a press release at nine o'clock with an embargo of 10, including a link to the report, thus we will avoid a rat race for you. Um, now uh, we have some of the finest experts for you in Europe. Here in Brussels, please uh, let me introduce uh, to you Daniel Gross, uh, formerly from CEPS, now with Bocconi University in Milano, where he has founded an Institute for European Policymaking at Bocconi University. Then there is Clemens Fuß, president of the IFO Institute, professor at the University of Munich, and my boss. And nearly last, but absolutely not least, there is Nobel Prize winner Jean Tirol. He is with the Toulouse School of Economics, TSE. And in spite of his Austrian name, he's a Frenchman who somehow has preferred to stay in his hometown, the beautiful Cité Rose, and not coming to Brussels, but he joins us via video. And um, last but not least, we also expected Mario Monti to be joining us, but I can't see him right now uh, on our video. He should be joining us from Milano. If he does, he would be welcome. Um, we will now listen to short introduction by Professor Fust, and then we'll come to your questions, as is the custom for press conferences. We have about an hour for the whole thing, slightly less. Um, Professor Fust, the floor is yours. Uh, okay, thank you very much. So, uh, as you've seen from the press release, this is a report is about research and development and innovation in the EU. Uh, now, I think we're all aware that the EU is not doing great in this area. Um, one might even say it is losing the global innovation race, especially if compared to the US, but increasingly also compared to China. Uh, EU industry invests less than its peers in research and development. Um, uh, the difference is not so much about the governments, but it's about uh, the private sector. It's about uh, industry. Governments are, are both spending in the US and the EU are both spending about 0.7% of GDP. Uh, but if you look at the private sector, uh, it's 2.3% in the US and EU companies uh, spend only half of it. Uh, but the key issue and our interest today is really not just about the level of spending, it's also about the area where the money is spent, the structure of the spending. And here the EU lags way behind in sectors that are classified as high-tech sectors like software, artificial intelligence, uh, pharmaceutical uh, research, biotechnology, uh, and so on. Um, if you look at Europe for over 20 years, more or less the same companies, mostly from the automotive sector, uh, have been dominating research and development uh, spending. So there has been a focus on uh, middle technology sectors, and that's why we say the EU is caught in what you might call a middle technology trap. Now, what we do in this report is a look at EU innovation policies. If you think, what can you do about it? It's far from easy. Uh, and what we focus on in this report is uh, the existing EU programs to foster innovation, uh, including um, uh, and focusing on those under the heading of the European Innovation Council. Uh, now, the European Innovation Council um, could be considered as something like a European answer uh, to the U.S. Advanced Research Project Agency program, uh, which is, uh, as it were, the gold standard in international innovation policy. But uh, the European Innovation Council, that's what, what we explain in the report, is not really up to this task. The decision process is still very political. It imposes collaboration uh, among institutions, for instance, in different member states, instead of accompanying them too much, 
uh, of the limited resources is devoted to venture capital uh, investment to supporting small and medium sized firms. So this is directed uh, to correct for capital market uh, frictions, but uh, it does not focus on what should be its focus, which is breakthrough leap innovation. Uh, so we propose a reform of the following type. The EU should move to a more APA-style model of governance, uh, and we propose a shift of resources to support high-risk, high-return projects. And these are projects that are uh, quite far still from commercial application. Project selection and management should be improved by increasing the scientific and engineering excellence of the EIC board uh, and by delegating more to scientists. And as I said, the current venture capital activities should be outsourced to a special fund and uh, the EIC should focus on leap innovation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we would now uh, proceed to your questions. Um, if you're joining us via Zoom, then please raise your yellow hand or whatever it is on your software. And if you're here in Brussels, Please uh, press the button in front of you and the red light will go on for the microphone. So please, who would like to ask a question? Okay. There's an awkward silence. <laughs> Maybe Jean Tirol uh, would, would like to add something from his point of view uh, in Toulouse before our journalists come up with uh, clever ideas to ask. No, I think uh, Clemens uh, summarized things very well. Um, it's pretty clear that a very small fraction of the budget is going to disruptive innovation, uh, less than 5%. So we're way, way behind what has been done for many, many years uh, in the uh, US. And that's comfort or meat trap, a meat technology trap, uh, if we don't go beyond that. So there are, there are several issues. There's, there, there's the issue of overall budget. Uh, there is the issue of the allocation of the budget, uh, which uh, goes mainly to uh, basically, if I had to characterize uh, this, this situation, we basically finance SMEs and a few startups, but we don't uh, engage in disruptive innovation. We do so that to some extent. It's a bit unfair what I'm saying, but you know um, we are way behind in terms of uh, facilitating uh, disruptive innovation. So we have to reorient the budget toward that, and we have to change the governance accordingly because you know the way it's done um, with the um, um, DARPA and in, in in the US also with uh, successful stories for supporting. Uh, uh, higher education and research. So in, in the US, the National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Health, and in Europe, the European Research Council, which has worked extremely well, um, they have a different type of governance, which is much less political and basically call, calling for the highest experts in Europe or in the US in uh, for NSF or DARPA uh, to actually assess a project and give to a small number of recipients uh, the uh, the money instead of spreading it out um, among recipients, which is a bit of an issue with many of the programs in the in in the EU. There is nothing wrong with collaboration, of course. We need collaboration, but you know, collaboration for the sake of uh, of collaboration is not going to work. Uh, collaboration has to be bottom up and not top down. So there are lots of things to be done, and we must have the courage to do it. Um, otherwise, we we'll, we know in 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 ten or fifteen or twenty years we won't exist. Um, we already don't exist to some extent. Unfortunately, despite all the talent we have, uh, you, you look at the top uh, twenty uh, tech companies. Uh, none of them is European. You look at the top 20 startups in the world, none of them is European. So we are way, way behind. So that means the value creation is, is, is little. And that also means that we're losing not only in terms of economic welfare, but also in, in terms of the geopolitical influence and regulatory influence uh, in terms of regulating tech. So um, we have to do something. 
Good, thank you very much. There's the first uh, question from uh, Manfred Ronsheimer from uh, from Berlin. We try to open your mic. There you are. Yeah, hallo, bin ich zu hören? Yes, we can hear you. Darf ich kurz auf Deutsch fragen, dann geht's schneller. Äh, mich interessiert ah, vor allem... Wen? <lacht> An Herrn Fuß äh, ah, ja. zunächst. Ja, ja. Ähm, äh, was muss eigentlich jetzt passieren? Sie haben die Situation dargestellt, die Misere, dass wir abgehängt werden in Europa. Was muss passieren? Sowohl von den Regierungen, den nationalen Regierungen, der EU-Kommission und den Unternehmen der Wirtschaft. Was ist die Agenda? Uh, okay, thank you. I answer in English, if that's okay. Yes, yes, it's okay. But he... I understand. So, so the question is, uh, what needs to be done and what do the different layers of government do? Uh, and uh, what you uh, allude to in your question is, of course, is what we propose in this report. Is this enough? Now, I think what we propose in this report is obviously a very important point, but it's only one aspect of the overall uh, performance that's pretty clear. So the bulk of uh, government support is uh, at the national level in Europe, and there's a lot to say about that. But um, I think one important starting point is really the European level and what we are suggesting here. Uh, of course, a lot of the issues we raise here are also relevant for national policies. Um, Germany has founded this uh, Agentur für Sprung Innovation, this LEAP, Uh, innovations agency so that's you know how how is it working it it has some issues it is uh, constantly under reform uh, making that work better is key but we are not talking only about uh, funding research there are uh, you know in terms of conditions for creating new companies uh, of uh, in terms of conditions for doing research uh, in high tech areas uh, a lot a lot of things need to be changed we have issues with the european capital markets we have issues with venture capital funding we are world champions in savings but our capital is going to the us and the americans you know at low interest rates and the americans are investing it in in their own venture capital funds we have issues in the tax system so i think we what, what is needed is a more comprehensive agenda uh, to um, make the EU catch up in innovation, but uh, you have to start somewhere. And in this report, we start with the European level where you really have to look at the details and uh, come up with proposals to change things. But it, I, I would say it's the beginning of this European innovation initiative. It's not the end. Thank you very much. We have now a question from Michael Sauger, who is so kind as to cross the bottom. I just want to ask uh, you 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 mentioned that it was that we are now in a in a mid technology trap but for years it seemed that Germany or Europe uh, has an advantage in middle technology and uh, that automotive uh, and other traditional industries are a strength of Europe and the the strategy was to transfer this strength to the new uh, green uh, climate neutral era so what brings you now to the to the um, uh, to to the impression that this was the wrong way and that we have to change in into a direction where Europe uh, lags behind uh, for years and years? Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so the question is, of course. Uh, when you are second best, uh, you can be proud because you're not third. So it was good to have a strength in automobile sector, uh, lacking anything else. Uh, but our concern is more that we can how can we when how can we bring Europe to play more in the Premier League? Uh, and uh, what we observe is that uh, the automobile sector, automotive sector, and other related ones uh, are very strong, but uh, they have not moved over the last twenty years. And the, the growth prospects that we show in our report of the automotive sector are just more limited than in the other high tech sector, where the growth prospects are much, much higher. So uh, the, the mid tech trap means that we might be strong in this middle technology. So it's not bottom, right? But it's the second Bundesliga uh, where um, we, we are limited uh, 
or our industry is limited in the growth prospects. And I think what we need in Europe, as uh, Clemens and uh, and Jean explained, uh, more uh, new enterprises, industries in the higher growth, high tech areas. Um, if we just stay always in the second lane, other countries, industries will uh, surpass us. Maybe I can add. Thank you very much. Yep. Maybe I can add, add one point. I mean, this is not just about growth prospects. So, you know, as a matter of fact, nobody really knows about the future. But even in the past, if you look at the last twenty years and and growth of these sectors and profitabilities of the companies, uh, growth has been higher in these high tech sectors. And if you have a faster growing sector, it's natural that this sector also invests more in R&D. So the R&D dynamics for the economy as a whole are completely different when you focus on, on these two sectors. I mean, it's 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 correct. You have to ask, I mean, is it not true that everybody is focusing on their comparative advantage? But uh, if you think about it, there is a lot of policy that influences research and development. It's not a pure market process. It's not a pure market driven process. So the government does intervene. Uh, uh, and uh, there's also path dependency. So if you have large companies like Mercedes and VW, um, they will have a tendency to invest their money in their businesses. And if other com other countries have fast growing, very profitable high tech companies, there will be a lot of money available. And and in a way, you you get more and more specialization, a vicious or a virtuous circle, depending on how, you, on how you define it. So you have these large companies, they are dominating the market, they invest more, their dominance increases, and there's really an increasing specialization now. And final point, maybe I think there is a risk, thinking again about the future, that the, the car market is moving towards commoditization. So if you think about the large Chinese ships preparing to, to ship over all these electric vehicles, there is a clear risk that this, at least part, the lower quality segments are becoming a commodity. Uh, and that's not good news for Europe, which focuses on automotive. Thank you very much. There's another question. Could you please say your name and your, your Olga opinion? Chair Handelsblatt. Um, if you look a little bit more into to China, like what can the EU do do to um, compare with China? Maybe both can answer. I mean, we can do very little about China itself, right? <laughs> <clears throat> um, they they continue uh, with uh, both very high investment uh, in capital and increasingly also investment in R and D. Um, which, uh, according to some metrics, could actually be already higher than than our own. It's very difficult to compare when the salaries of researchers are so much lower in China than they are in Europe. But they have certainly more more manpower. And uh, what we have to do is to adapt. Uh, and uh, we cannot uh, try to dominate certain sectors in which the Chinese are investing very heavily. I think uh, we can, however, uh, or our industry could and should go into these niches where we have a comparative advantage. Right? Mm -hmm. China will not have, might have an absolute advantage everywhere, but comparatively speaking, in some areas they are less, uh, they are less strong. Let me just give you one example, which many of you know, uh, in the chip sector, which so much uh, excites many politicians. Uh, you know, the chip sector is software is US, and that's an increasing part of the value of a chip. Uh, the fabs, the big factories which churn out the chips are extremely capital intensive, and they are in the most uh, savings rich region of the world, which is Asia. Uh, but we have very strong companies in the machines, right, where there are no economies of scale and where you need many small suppliers. So I think that is a niche where Europe can uh, can compete and does compete. And I think we have to accept that uh, we cannot dominate the entire value chain. And uh, coming back to our uh, our topic, uh, uh, the, the key issue is for European and also national innovation policy to open new, new areas to support this uh, research, which today is very far from commercial application, but tomorrow might be it. Um, 
if I can just continue, just because the chip sector is so interesting for something that um, um, Clemens just mentioned, uh, the famous Dutch company, which does the best machines for chips making, was an offspin of Philips, mm -hmm. which said, this is not our core business. And the technology they're using came from a project financed actually by DARPA in the US. Mm -hmm. um, so you, we can see both the importance of financing uh, um, research, advanced research, far from commercial application, which then decades later uh, becomes important. I think, uh, Jean, you also referred to the biotech example. Um, there are other areas where one can see how um, supporting innovation, which is at the beginning very far from commercial applications, can have a lasting impact. Yeah, I think we need to think more about the China because if you, it's already there in a sense. You know, I mentioned the 20 top uh, tech companies in the <laughs> world. There are 11 American and nine uh, Chinese. Uh, so China is already here. And as, as Daniel said, there is a lot of investment there in human capital, in capital and, and R&D. So, so things are moving there. And um, the question is, why aren't we there? And that's a, that's a big question. There is not single policy or multiple policy why we are not in that space. We have talent. Um, and when this talent gets money, uh, we can succeed. So if you think about uh, Hugo Sain, uh, that you know well in Germany, um, he, uh, he got an ERC grant uh, to work on the uh, messenger RNA, uh, which was actually not about vaccine, but you know, then it was very quickly transformed into a vaccine application. And thanks to this European Research Council grant, he actually was able to uh, actually do incredible stuff and uh, build uh, BioNTech uh, with that and, and be successful in the market. Um, so we have lots of talent, but you know, the same thing, we have lots of good mathematicians. So why is that that we are absent in AI, more or less? Uh, I mean, th there are reasons for that, but you know, there's, it's not because we don't have talent and we have extremely good mathematicians. So. The question is really is whether we'll be playing in the second league, as Daniel said. And you know, the uh, um, tomorrow the value creation will become mainly from from AI, from genetics, from bio, biotech, and so on. And if we are not in that spectrum, it's going to be a disaster. By the way, in pharma, we are not bad in Europe. I mean, we still have a some companies in the top 15 uh, pharma, pharmaceutical companies in, in the world. Uh, so we are not bad, but you know, for how long? I mean, pharma is changing very fast. And it's like automobile, uh, automotive, right? I mean, Daniel, oh no, Clemens mentioned that actually we we could be leapfrog uh, because now you are, you know, the technologies are different, you know, electric and uh, self-driving and this and that. So it's not clear that your comp comparative advantage of the past is, will still be a comparative advantage in the future. Um, and same thing, pharma is changing very fast. And of course, AI and the like uh, actually are becoming important in pharma. So we'll be, we'll, we'll be there again, you know, we are still there, we're still pretty good, but for how long? So we need to understand that, you know, it's not only the U.S., China is there and China is investing very, very strongly. Thank you very much. Some more questions? Yeah. Thank you. Could you please yeah. say? Good your... morning, Leven Taylor. I, fortunately, I came too late to hear Professor, uh, uh, the professor in, in uh, Toulouse. But um, the problem, I, you mentioned that the problem is industry. Hmm? Uh, but is it also not, for instance, when looking at Germany, uh, from here, from Belgium, because I'm Belgian, uh, is it not also that there has been a change in these last years in this middle industry, which was perfectly the success of Germany also, uh, that there has been a change in management, a change in management whereby there are, have been families that, that, that this traditional concept of 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 uh, industries of family industries and so on 
that it, it, it is for a lot for, with modern management that it has diminished a lot. There are still, there are examples from both sides. There are both examples of uh, industries, uh, SMEs managed, uh, badly managed. That's true. No? But there are also a lot of examples of well-managed SMEs who are in a good position and who are even a leader in certain sectors. I'm thinking, for instance, of a Belgian example, which I know a bit better, that's in diesel engines. Diesel engines passed, but diesel engines for ships and electrogen groups, middle, middle diesel engines. They are developing it uh, for, uh, and they are only independent middle company, but working with the biggest in the world. Uh, they, for having diesel engines working on on uh, hydrogen, it's not a problem. Technically, it seems rather easy. In fact, to have diesel engines for maritime uh, uh, occupation, to have it to have it changed to to hydrogen. So this is an example of an independent SME. What I heard in I had the sense that you were especially looking. It should be the the, the big ones, <laughs> but the 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 resilience for the is life for me also mostly in real SMEs, not mm. SMEs that are completely dependent from big ones, but SMEs that have but they have to be in a in a in a possibility to collaborate to have an open system to collaborate with others. For that sense, for instance, EMEC in Belgium is also a good example that brings together different actors in a called a neutral way. It's not an industrial actor, but he has been important, notably for us, uh, the, the Dutch uh, company uh, that was mentioned for uh, the machinery for uh, ISML. Yeah, maybe Professor Fuß could answer that because I think family enterprise is something that you know something about it. Uh, yes, thank you. So I think what you are actually referring to is this idea that Europe and especially Germany has a lot of hidden champions, Belgium, the Netherlands uh, of companies we call hidden champions. So these are uh, medium sized companies, medium sized, meaning not the classical small and medium enterprise size up to 500 employees, but maybe up to 5000 or 10,000. Uh, employees, yes. Uh, for instance, there are there are studies saying that we have something like 1,500 companies like that in Germany. They have a, typically have a very strong market position. They are extremely specialized, and as you say, they often cooperate with other companies, uh, large companies. I think in the ASLM example, Daniel Gross mentioned. Uh, you have, for instance, the German company Trumpf delivering the laser technology with a, you know, uh, or the company Zeiss that delivered part of the technology uh, and without them, the production wouldn't be possible. I, I think this does point to the this concept mentioned by Daniel that maybe Europe's opportunity is doing a research and development uh, and being innovative uh, in areas where returns to scale are not so important or market scale is not so important because we still have a fragmented market that's one of our problems in europe we have a small market we have this is a disadvantage relative to china and the us uh, but i mean if you look at what with the process the developments we are describing here we have we had these companies 20 years ago uh, and we are nevertheless falling back in research and development. And, and I think it's not so much a problem of these companies. They have their governance. Family governance has disadvantages and advantages. Uh, you can kind of spend a lot, a, lot, a lot of time discussing that. But I think these companies are still there, but they are not enough. I think the lack of movement, this trap idea we're describing here, is happening in the big companies. And the big companies are empirically very important for technology development. 20 years ago, we write that in the report, uh, the companies leading in research and development spending in Europe were Volkswagen, Mercedes, and Siemens. And 20 years later, it's Volkswagen, Mercedes, and Bosch. Okay, so no movement. We are in this, yes, in this great car industry. Uh, and I think the smaller companies just cannot compensate for that. I don't think there is a decline in these. There's no evidence of a decline in these companies, but they don't have this power in driving technologies at least not without their la the large company counterparts. 
and 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 uh, you get the impression and that's really what's missing and what's also missing as Jean mentioned that is the startups I mean that we have no there there, there are some cases like by Bio, BioNTech um maybe uh, smaller companies like Zilonis there are some good startups but nothing compared to what we see in the US it's just yeah. missing May I come back to my first question? Is it is not the way that business is taught? The way that, for instance, I think Mr. Tironem was known for having speaking uh, for about common good and so on. Uh, is it not that that is lost a bit in the industries? When I talk to industries, yes, we are European, but at the same time, they go to invest because there are more subsidies in the United States with money to offer public funds. So it's it's uh, it's also a bit on that, on 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 this on, on common good, which was far more present, I think, in the generation of my parents, for instance. Well, I would say if it had been more present, we would now not be in this middle technology trap. It's not something recent. What we are describing here is a very long process. Uh, yes, yes, you know, it's it's been a process of over two decades, so I think it's not something of the last three years. Okay, Daniel Gross would like to add something, and uh, I have also a semi-intelligent question. Um, yeah, I'm from the Chicago School, and um, I find it always very uh, difficult to say we have to rely on industrialists having a having the common good in mind. Um, they should make profits and they should find profit opportunities in Europe. And they should find profit opportunities, not just in their own little or oh, big garden, right? In the technology they know, which they might improve incrementally a bit, but also in new sectors, right? Which could be many different ones. And what we observe is that that's not happening. And uh, one way to improve the likelihood, at least, that these things emerge is that uh, when the, the government uh, encourages and finances research, which normally enterprises don't do because it's very far from commercial application. Right? And that's, as, as Jean said earlier, that's one of the criticisms that we have of the European Innovation Council. If you uh, finance just things which are close to commercial application, right? industry might have done it themselves. But the path-breaking ones, far from it, uh, that is done uh, too little uh, in Europe, and it's done, it's supported too little by uh, the EU level. Can I just ask the question, if there is this company um, that is uh, making diesel engines right now and tries to change the uh, into uh, hydrogen, uh, that they could use hydrogen. Would that, for you, would that be high tech? Would that be middle? High? What's your classification? I mean, I think there's the methodological problem here. Where, where is that? Um, I would uh, cl <clears throat> classify that as mid tech. It's it prolongs the life of a known known technology, but it's not something like, uh, as Raw mentioned, the uh, mRNA <laughs> discovery. Uh, or uh, applying um, um, generative AI to finding new uh, new molecules in in bio in biotechnology and other things that opens those things open new fields. This is just growing the life of a known old field. Okay, so uh, that's that. Any other questions or remark, uh, Jean Tirol? Were you well, I thought about the, to say the something? The question on the common good is a good one. I mean, uh, you know, it's it's hard to ask. Uh, and you know, the, I'm following up on Daniel's answer. Sure, we have a social responsibility, and that's part of the reason we are still in Europe, actually, um, because we we care about Europe. But uh, at some point, we want to be able to compete in the in the world economy, and if the conditions are not there. It's not even clear that uh, staying in Europe all the time is always the best solution. Uh, I regret it very deeply, and we need to we need to change that. But the consequence of this, by the way, I mean, it applies to small firm, large firms, and in terms of uh, European policy, um, you know, I think they have to be agnostic. So, you know, 
there are there is great innovation in small firms. Um, actually, in pharma, it's often the case because it's mainly in startups that things happen, uh, not in big pharma. Um, and we see that um, the top tech tech firm in the U.S. didn't exist uh, thirty years ago. Most of them, so so they started as very small firms. So innovation can be everywhere. In Europe, it tends to be more in, in large firms, but there's no reason for why it should be the case. Uh, so I think the policy should be completely agnostic with respect to that, the size. It should be agnostic with respect to the charter. Um, actually, DAPA is, you know, if, if, for example, it's better done in a university, it would be done in a university. Um, so what matters is the project, not not the age, the size, or, or the charter of the, of the entity. Um, on collaboration, yes, I mean, especially for small firms, one needs collaboration. But, you know, as I said earlier, I think um, basically the experts know pretty well who could be bringing synergy to them. And, you know, in the end, what you want is, is a bottom-up thing where people decide on collaboration based on their interest on basically the, the partners who are going to bring the most on the table. Um, and, you know, they have fair amount of information on that. So I think collaboration should be encouraged. It should not be mandatory. And one of the problems with many European policies is that they force collaboration with, of course, an hidden agenda, which is basically to make sure that lots of people get some money but the outcome of that is that you get collaboration. I mean, I have a lot of experience in the in the academic world where we collaborate across fields, we collaborate across universities and so on. But we do that in a well-informed way and totally voluntary way, whenever it's uh, it's to get a little bit more money through, through a call, um, that doesn't work. I mean, basically people gather and, and pretend they're going to collaborate to get the money and then they don't do any things together. So, so, so that has to be kept in mind. Collaboration are, are good, but they have, they have to be voluntary. Thank you. We have another question from Michael Sauger. Uh, some people say that the big advantage of the US is not so much in it inventing new technologies, but in the broad adaptation of a new technology through the whole economy. And, um, and and that, that this is uh, the missing link in, in, in Europe. Do you agree with this uh, opinion and what can Europe do to encourage this? Would like to answer that? Faust, Lagrange, Monsieur Tirol. Yeah, I, 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 can, I can say, I can say, say a few words. Yes, because the US has this large internal market. So scaling a project when it's close to uh, when you have a startup is a, is easier in the US, you also have a different capital market, but we also have differences at this early stage with leap innovations. And that, that's what we describe in the report. What, what the ARPA model does uh, is different from what we do here in Europe. What John just described, this forced collaboration, these very bureaucratic projects. So we in Europe, we, we do not enough focus on one thing, which is give the experts and the inventors freedom and focus totally on excellence and success and don't care so much about you know is there a bulgarian uh, and and uh, a french and a german and uh, whatever a spanish uh, partner in the consortium only focus on excellence uh, and that's what what we need to get going so it's both it's true that we have these scaling issues but there is more to that um, okay, thank you. Maybe we can use uh, the uh, uh, the image of uh, seeding um, or throwing seeds on the ground and how fertile the ground is. In a sense, in the US, the, the ground is more fertile in a sense it it takes more easily to new things, right, for a variety of uh, of reasons, labor markets and others. Uh, but you also need enough seeds. And uh, what uh, we are arguing is that in the US, there's also many more seeds being <laughs> sown uh, by, by the DAPA model, whereas in Europe, uh, our seeding is uh, very scarce. 
so uh, the bigger problem of changing the entire uh, terrain is 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 something that uh, is we cannot address in one report but i think the seeding could be much improved and that already would be one step forward so Maybe we're back in agriculture also. now uh well, yeah, yeah, so a little bit on that uh, the because what was said what is very important um in practice um you know knowledge is created and it's created a lot in the us because the us attracts the best scientists um and that's that's of course very important now you might say knowledge is is a is a public good i mean it's created and once it's there it, it's for everyone whether the person is in europe or in china or in japan uh, but that's not quite true because there's a lot of tacit knowledge and people uh, who actually can make this happen. There's also proximity. So, you know, it's pretty fit. well known that Steve Jobs, for example, went to Xerox Park, which was next door, and discovered things like graphical user interface and things like that. Lots of things that he incorporated into Apple. I mean, Apple, if you think it's a, it's a fabulous company, but, you know, in terms of innovation, uh, it borrows a lot from uh, what has been done at, uh, you know, NSF and DARPA. Um, same thing for the pharmaceutical industry, which borrows a lot from NIH in the U.S. So the seats are there. It's very important. Now, you you know, the person who, who has a question, of course, is right that also in terms of, uh, you know, bringing the stuff to the market, uh, the U.S. is also tends to be superior. Um, sometimes because it has a large internal market, sometimes because it has a venture capital system. It's hard to replicate because we have lots of venture capital, but doesn't come from people who have been entrepreneurs themselves. We have a, a lack of entrepreneurship courses in universities. They are very seldom taught. Uh, we have labor laws, which uh, one can like or dislike, but are not appropriate for for startups, because startups, you know, they are meant to fail very often, and uh, it's highly qualified personnel who can find a job very fast. So, our protective, I mean, of course, it's it's member state specific, but our, our labor laws are not where they should be, at least for for the uh, for the startup environment. So, and there are many other causes. It's, you you cannot point at a single factor. There are many factors uh, for why we're not the U.S., but you know our, our point of view is that giving up on what's going to create value is is kind of dangerous. All the more that our strengths uh, can be fraught. Hey, thank you very much. Um, any other questions? I mean, the, the U.S. is always a, a very interesting example in uh, every way. I mean, if you look at Boeing, actually, you're not going to say that this is high tech, but this is very much middle tech or low tech. Uh, I mean, if doors uh, fly out of a plane, uh, which has just been built, then it's it's pretty weird. There's some other issues at stake there. But also, I mean, sorry, Peugeot, but you know, if you look under the Chrysler cars, uh, suspension techniques are very often from the 18th century in, in Chrysler cars. But, uh, you know, uh, so there are some weird things going on in the U.S. There's very much high tech, but there's also some parts that are pretty much low tech, I'm afraid, isn't it? Not everything in the U.S. is gold. <laughs> That's quite <Yeah>. clear. <laughs> Uh, actually, I uh, think the U.S. can live with a weaker manufacturing or a middle tech sector because they have the rest, right? And we don't, right? Uh, so, um, as I said, it's not that everything is, is there perfect. And since you mentioned the aircraft sector, we have a little box in the, in the, in the report where we actually show that uh, aerospace and defense in Europe is actually pretty well done. I come back to what I said earlier, that's a sector where you don't have economies of scale, right? And where, I mean, aircrafts are not built by the thousand, by, maybe in the over a very long period. Some are. <laughs> yeah, but it's not like um, solar panels, right? Um, so uh, 
uh, that's why I think in, in aircraft our 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 industry is still pretty strong. Um, but it's a repeat. I'm not say, we are not saying the U.S. is an example in every sector. Good. Any other questions coming here from the room, Levin? And that's it. Somebody else outside. I'm looking at the. I'm just giving you a mobile. Uh, I'll give you some time to come up with a question. Alessandra Briganti has never said a word. If you wanted to say that this is your last chance, it's 10.46. No? Okay. So I think everybody's satisfied. Thank you very much. Happy writing um, and happy reading also because, you know, this is a 60-page long uh, report which uh, you might work through today. There's also a public um, uh, event this afternoon starting at 12.30 and you're all invited to go there today here at the Bavarian representation. Thank you. Bye-bye.